Welcome to 3ABN's Fall Camp Meeting, Homecoming 2018. Featuring inspired messages from your 3ABN family. And featured speaker, Ty Gibson. All to prepare your heart for the coming of the Lord. Hello, friends, and welcome back to the final evening of the 3ABN Fall Camp Meeting here, right here in 2018. Can you guys, can you believe it's 2018? That's, that's incredible. We have been so blessed here at this camp meeting with all of the wonderful music and the wonderful messages. Do you guys agree with that? Uh, and, and we are so thankful for each and every one of you who have joined us here uh, at the worship center here at the 3ABN headquarters and all of you at home uh, who, have, who are joining us around the world live and tuning in. We are so blessed. And I know we're going to be continued, uh, continued to be blessed because uh, it's not over yet. Uh, we still have a wonderful song uh, that's going to be brought to us uh, by Miss Yvonne Lewis. And the title of that song is Remember Me. And as soon as Miss Yvonne is finished with her song, uh, then the next person you will see is Brother Ty Gibson. And the title of his sermon is Our Covenant Identity in Christ. So thank you, Miss Yvonne. dying on the cross and he knew all along that he had done wrong and for his sins he must die and so he turned and saw the Christ with his blood flowing down he knew he had found the one who could save his soul and so he cried remember me when you come into your kingdom O oh lord remember me when you talk to your and tell him that I know I've not been all he wants me to be. But in mercy now I plead, remember me. shall be with me eternally it is for you that I die oh now I know Christ lives again and he stands all alone before the white throne with his own Righteous life, he covers mine. So now I cry, remember me when you come into your kingdom, O oh Lord. Remember me when you talk to your father and tell him that I know I've not been all he wants me to be. But in mercy now I plead, remember me. But in mercy now, 
Thank you. How beautiful. Well, good evening, everybody. This is our final time together. And the message tonight is best served by the ladies helping me out here for a moment. Uh, women, I want you to imagine that you and I have never met. You don't know who I am. You've never seen my face. You come home. You open your door. You walk in, and you see me sitting on your sofa eating a sandwich. Now, something immediately happens inside of you. The first thing you think, of course, is, why is this strange man in my house, on my sofa, eating my sandwich material? Those avocados were for later. <laughs> but the next thing you think is, and maybe you don't wrap words around it, but you have a sense that you have been trespassed, that you have been violated, because this space on planet Earth, your home, is your domicile, your domain. It's a territory that you hold in the world. It belongs to you. The door locks. You come in, and you have a perfect right to be there. I come in, I do not have a perfect right to be there. You, your domicile, your territory has been breached. It has been violated. And just as you are about to tell me to get out of your house, your husband emerges from a back room and says, oh, hey, sweetie, this is my new friend, Ty. He likes sandwiches. I invited him over. So he's having a sandwich with me. Did anything change in the scenario? Did anything change inside of you? Well, of course it did, because you and your husband hold this domain, this territory, together. It is jointly held, is it not? And I was invited legitimately into your space, into your domain, by someone who has a perfect right to invite someone in. Suddenly, everything's fine, and you have a seat on the sofa next to me and have a sandwich as well. Everything's fine now. I'm going to suggest to you this evening that whether we ever explain it to ourselves in detail, we have an intuitive sense about this thing we call territory. Because we are free moral agents, we sense that we exist in a shared world and that there are legitimate boundaries. We also sense that those boundaries can only be crossed by permission because we are free moral agents. Now, I want to bring to you this angle on the plan of salvation by calling your attention, first of all, to a remarkable book that I need on the screen in front of me, a remarkable book by William Barrett. William Barrett was a philosopher and probably one of the best thinkers in philosophy over the last 50 to 100 years. And Barrett summarizes in his book this amazing treatment, The Irrational Man. He summarizes that there are only two ways, really, of processing reality, two ways of thinking as human beings, two ways of thinking, Hebraism and Hellenism. Between these two points of influence moves the world, or the world moves. He's saying there's the Hebrew way of thinking and there's the Greek way of thinking. Greek referred to here as Hellenism. There are only two ways of processing information. It doesn't matter who you are, whether you've ever sat down and really thought it through. You think in a Hebrew manner or in a Greek manner or maybe a mixture of the two that needs to be sorted out. The Bible is a Hebrew book. It's not a Greek book. The New Testament was written in Greek by Hebrews. Jesus was and is a Jewish Messiah. He was a Hebrew. 
And Jesus came into the world through a Hebrew narrative so that everything that is occurring in the New Testament is occurring against the backdrop and upon the stage of that Hebrew narrative that we call the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures. Now, the Greek way of thinking is centered on power. God is conceived of in terms of sheer power. It doesn't matter if you like him or not, he's in charge. The Hebrew way of thinking is that God is love and that actually God's character either solicits or repels our engagement. The Hebrew way of thinking says God is a particular kind of God who is to be worshipped and praised because of the attributes of his character. The Greek way of thinking says it doesn't matter what you think or what God is like. You had better get with his program because he has power over you. Christianity down through the ages has been infiltrated by Greek thinking, so much so that many believers in Christ, in name, have lost track of the fact that we as believers in Christ are living out a Hebrew narrative, not a Greek one. So within our framework for our purposes this evening, I want to peel back a piece of the Hebrew story that is vital to understand who Jesus is and why he came to the world. So we go back to the beginning of the story as we have every previous message. Genesis chapter 1 verse, verses 26 and 27 tells us something that we're familiar with, but we're going to re-familiarize ourselves with this passage, and we're going to notice something that we don't normally take into account. The scripture says, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion, dominion over all the earth. Now, the image part of the text we quote frequently, God made man in his own image. The dominion part we've lost track of, and it is a distinctly territorial idea, like your home that was breached by the guy who loves sandwiches. So here, what we have is we have a presentation of the fact that God created human beings in his own image. Now, we normally think that that text is saying something to us like, God made man in his own image. That means he made us with characters like his character. That's true. But the context widens our perspective. We were made in the image of God not only character-wise, we were made in the image of God functionally, vocationally. Do you hear me? Functionally and vocationally. God operates in such a manner as to have a universe over which he presides as God. He creates a world and he creates the man and the woman, and rather than micromanaging them, setting up his own throne on earth, God says, let's create them in our image. And what is his image? Character, yes, but also let's give them dominion. That's the context. Let's give them autonomy. Let's let them operate with freedom over this domain. Let's give them a domicile. Are you still with me? Have I lost you? Okay, so if you fast forward in the story, this is the way Hebrew prophets think. According to Psalm 115, verse 16, listen to this language very carefully. The heavens, the heavens are the Lord's heavens. But, qualifier, the word but here is a grammatical qualifier. The heavens are the Lord's heavens, but the earth he has given, given to human beings. This is delegation language. God is not like the Greek gods. The one and only true God isn't like Zeus. He's not a power-mongering kind of God. He doesn't operate by sheer control. God, in fact, the God of Scripture, is not a micromanaging control freak. He's a delegator. God is the kind of God who gives autonomy and delegates authority. He says we're going to create the world. 
and we're going to give them dominion. This is fascinating. When you read the Genesis account, God sets up Eden. Eden is one piece of ground, a small piece of ground, we don't know how many acres it was, of ground on the earth, and God says, okay, this is what things look like when they're beautiful and wonderful and incredible. But I'm just giving you a little, a little example of the kind of stuff that you, with your God-given creativity, can do. So now what I want you to do is I want you to look around in this little piece of ground that I have myself cultivated for you, and now I want you to expand the beauty. I want you to beautify the whole earth. I want you to, I want you to go out from this central point called Eden and turn the whole world into a garden exercising your autonomy, your authority. Make it however you want to make it. Do whatever you want to do within the parameters of goodness and love and covenantal faithfulness. So God gives autonomy and delegates authority at the beginning of the story of Scripture. This is fascinating. Now, in the Greek way of thinking, God never delegates authority. God exercises authority. According to Plato and Aristotle, God is sheer being and power. In fact, there's a term you've probably heard that came to us out of Greek philosophy, specifically a term that was coined by Aristotle. And that term was that God is, in Aristotle's thinking, God is the unmoved mover. Have you heard the term? Now think about it for a minute. The unmoved mover. Mover. That is to say that God himself is static. He's impassable or without passion. He never experiences anybody acting upon him. God only himself moves all others. We're puppets on strings. We're characters in a novel, a story that's already told. You didn't decide to have Cheerios this morning, even though you're under the illusion that you made a free choice to have Cheerios. You were predetermined to have Cheerios this morning because God is sovereign over all. This theology comes into Christianity in what's called determinism or Calvinistic predestination in which the idea is expanded to take on the form that nobody ever chooses to be saved or lost, but that God predetermines who's saved, who's lost. This is where you get the, the doctrine of once saved, always saved. Because God unilaterally makes all the decisions in his universe. God is, in fact, according to Calvinism, a micromanaging, controlling kind of God. Nothing happens unless God makes it happen. So it doesn't matter if you get a cancer diagnosis or you are violated as a little boy or a little girl by an uncle or a brother or a daddy. The message is always the same. God had a plan in that horrific thing that happened to you. The fact is that God stands against what was done to you, and God condemns all violating actions that are contrary to covenantal love. And the only way that any of us can process God in a way that we would come to love him rather than to grovelingly fear him and serve him as slaves is to be liberated from the Greek way of processing God and reality and be delivered into the messianic or Hebrew way of thinking in which a human being was created in the image of God with free will. God is love, therefore God created creatures capable of love, which means we're also capable of not loving. All the bad stuff going down in human history, all of it, is traceable to violations of the covenant of love. God is not ultimately responsible for any horrible thing that has ever happened to anybody. And the great controversy unfolds in such a way that when all is said and done, when all is said and done, the character of God is completely exonerated, vindicated from all confusing Babylonian theological paradigms that lie sin at the door of God. So what's happening in the biblical narrative, in the Hebrew flow of thinking, is that God gives autonomy and delegates authority. So we're not surprised then when Jesus comes as the Messiah and he says, let me tell you how to pray. Our Father, who is in heaven, 
Hallowed be your name. Your character is amazing. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth the way it's done in heaven. Apparently, God's will is not done in all instances on earth. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, etc., etc. And then there's this part. And deliver us from evil. Or Luke's gospel says, deliver us from the evil one. Our territory has been breached. A foreign lord has taken control of planet Earth. Planet Earth is a territory held hostage by a power that is contrary to the will of God. And so believers pray in a great controversy sense. Let me just tell you something about prayer. Prayer in a Calvinistic sense, in a Greek sense, is trying to get God to do things he's not willing to do. Prayer in a Hebrew sense, prayer in a Hebrew sense is an act of war in the great controversy. It is me leveraging my free will as a child of God against the kingdom of darkness by inviting people, by inviting God and his angelic forces into people's lives and situations where they're not giving permission. I'm the husband in the house that's inviting God to have influence in my children's lives when they're not inviting God in to have influence. Prayer is an act of war in the great controversy. It's not trying to get God to be better than he is. God is always doing all the good he can to the degree that he can in every circumstance that he can, barring one factor one variable, one line that God will never cross. And that is the autonomy, the free will of human beings. God isn't made better than he already is through prayer. God is given permission to access situations that he is barred from accessing because we're free moral agents. He'll never kick the door down. He knocks. And prayer is the means by which we say, come on in, Lord, to my house. Have a sandwich if you'd like. Do whatever you want. You're welcome in my house. You're welcome in my town. You're welcome in my nation. You're welcome in my world. So our voices are united in intercessory prayer to give God increased access. This is what Jesus means when he says, hey, if two or three of you get together, I'll do whatever you say because I want to, but I need for two or three of you to leverage your free will in the great controversy to give me access. That's what's happening in the great controversy. So check this out. In this context, the Old Testament, that is the Hebrew story, assumes this territorial view of reality. When we come to the book of Job, for example, now there was a day, this is chapter 1, starting with verse 6, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them? Now, it's logical at this point to ask, what is he doing here? But listen, Satan shows up in some kind of heavenly conclave. There's a congress going on. There's a meeting and you'll notice that in this scripture, there was a day when the sons of God came, came to present themselves before the Lord. They were summoned. They were brought together before the Lord. There's some kind of meeting taking place. And Satan just kind of shows up. But watch how the conversation ensues. And the Lord said to Satan, not what you and I just asked, but something different. Not what are you doing here, but from where do you come? It's a territorial question. God doesn't say, what are you doing here? What is your justification? What he says, what is your point of origin? Because the sons of God are here, and they're representing various territories in God's vast universe. Satan comes, and he's there, and God says, um, what part of my universe are you purporting to represent? From where exactly do you come? What part of my universe are you here to supposedly speak on behalf of? Check this out. 
So Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. Have you ever bought a piece of property? What's one of the first things you do, if not the first thing you do when you buy a piece of property? You walk the property line. You stake it out. You figure out, you walk to and fro all over your piece, and you figure out, and you put stakes, and you say, okay, this is it. This is my territory. This is my domain. This is my plot of ground on planet Earth. The devil is telling God, hey, I've, I'm here to represent planet Earth and the human race. <laughs> Now, this is a very bold claim, but God doesn't throw him out. There's a legitimacy to his claim that we're about to see in a minute. It is a claim that has been taken in a dastardly manner, but it's a claim, nonetheless, that has been given teeth, and we'll see who it was given teeth by. So God responds and doesn't say, oh, fine, have a seat. I like you. God says, Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job that there is none like him on the earth? A blameless and an upright man, that's a moral evaluation. A moral evaluation. Watch this. And he fears God and he shuns evil. Well, evil has its source in Satan, who is in this heavenly congress purporting to represent planet Earth. So in that context, what is God essentially saying? God is saying, okay, you're here claiming to represent Earth, but I have a counterclaim, and his name is Job. You think you have control of the Earth, but I have a beachhead in that territory. I haven't given it up. And I plan on taking it back from you. This is between the lines that we'll see in just a moment. The war between good and evil is a territorial dispute. This is why when Jesus comes, one of the things he says to those who are listening to his teachings, he says, um, when this is all said and done, the meek will inherit the earth. It's coming back to you. I'm here to take the earth back and put it back in your hands. This is where Jesus says things like, fear not, little children. It is, your good, it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. The war between good and evil on one level is a territorial dispute. C.S. Lewis articulates it like this. There is no neutral ground in the universe. Just let that sink in for a minute. There is no neutral ground in the universe. Every square inch, every split second is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan, including your frontal lobe and mine, including the space between our ears as well as the terra firma under our feet. Every square inch, every second, claimed, counterclaimed. There's a great controversy going on that traces all the way back to the beginning of the war between good and evil. So then we come to the New Testament. We're crossing the bridge now from the Old Testament narrative to the New Testament, from the Hebrew story that's being told to the Hebrew Messiah who is bringing it to a conclusion. So Jesus comes into the world and he is somehow put in a position, well, not somehow, he's led by the Spirit into a war with Satan. Chapter 4 of Luke, verses 5 through 7, watch this, don't miss this. Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment. Now just pause right there and just imagine this. So Jesus is now in the world, and at the beginning of his ministry, a conflict occurs. And the conflict that occurs between him and the devil is not a physical conflict. It's not an arm wrestling match. It's not a duel. It's not a sword fight. There are no bombs. It is a political engagement. It is a dispute over territory. 
The devil takes him to a high mountain and he shows him all the kingdoms of the world in an instant. Now watch this, the next verse. And the devil said to him, the devil said to him, to the Messiah, all this authority I will give you and their glory for this has been delivered to me and I can give it to whomsoever I wish. What a claim, huh? Now, if you know the Hebrew story, if somebody didn't hand you a New Testament in Psalms, but you actually have the Old Testament between your covers, and if you take in the entire narrative, you know exactly what's going on here. There's a backdrop. When the devil says, if you bow down and worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of this world and the authority, and he says, because it was all given to me and I can give it to whoever I want, He's referring back to what event in the biblical story? The fall in Genesis. So when he says, it was given to me, who gave the world to Satan? Did God give the world to Satan? No. Adam gave the world to Satan. How did he give the world to Satan? Was it his to give? Yes, because we had noted that God gave him dominion. And because he had dominion, the fall of mankind involved an abdication of authority. And this is why it is a legitimate title that Satan bears at this juncture of the great controversy that Scripture is describing here. In John 12, 31, Jesus himself says that Satan is the ruler of this world. He just is. So when he shows up in that heavenly meeting, and God doesn't just throw him out. It's because there's a legitimacy to the claim because the ones who had authority gave it to him. So he's the ruler of this world. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, he's called the God of this age. And Ephesians 2.2 2 says that he is the prince of the power of the air. That doesn't mean, by the way, that he's the the ruler of the oxygen supply. That's not what the word air means there. Oxygen is not the issue here. It's more like the idea he's the prince of the power of the popular trends in society and in the world. He's the one who presides over pop culture. He's the one who is pushing the buttons for the general moral trends of society. This is what the Germans call the Zeitgeist, the spirit of the age. He is the one who is presiding over the trends in society. So John will, will say, the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. Sway means there is a current. There's a moral current to society, and the devil is the one who's presiding over it. So he is the God of this age. He is the prince of this world. So let's draw a conclusion from where we've come from so far in order to launch forward with clarity now. Essentially, what we've said to this point in our time together is that the fall of humanity was, yes, it was a moral fall. That's the part we're generally familiar with. Adam and Eve sinned, and we take that to mean, and rightly so, that they fell on a moral level. Yes, there was a moral fall, but the fall of humanity was a moral fall, and as a result, it was a governmental fall. A political coup occurred. The fact is that a foreign invading force, a fallen angel, took the world from humanity through deception and temptation. So a moral fall gave way to a governmental fall. Or we could say it this way, if you like this language better. The goal with language is simply to understand. So, so if, if, if this helps, essentially the fall of mankind constitutes a transfer of dominion. A transfer of dominion occurred. Now this transfer of dominion happened by the free choice of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve abdicated their dominion over the earth. Now, in order to make the point, I want you to just, just reason with me here for a minute. 
I want you to hypothetically imagine that the fall had never occurred. What if Adam and Eve had said no to the deceptions and temptations of Satan? What if the sin problem had never entered the world, hypothetically? Question, would Adam and Eve still be alive today? How old would they be? Just take a wild guess. Approximately 6,000 years old. Where would they live? In Iraq. Would it be beautiful there? Oh, it would be gorgeous. But not only would it be beautiful there, the whole world by this point would just be, what did Isaiah say? Blossoming like a rose, the whole world. So Adam and Eve would still be alive. They would live somewhere over near Babylon, no doubt. And listen, who would they be to us? Well, they'd be great, 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 totally great grandma and grandpa. And they'd be really young. Adam and Eve would look like if they did that whole guess my age thing, if Adam and Eve were still alive right now and they said, hey, hey, guess how old we are. Just by appearances, we'd say, I don't know, 22? Because entropy would have never happened. The aging process would have never kicked in. The sin problem would have never tarnished creation. They would be young and old simultaneously. And who would they be to us? They would be the representative heads of the human race. And any time God, what did it say in Job? There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Who would go to represent us? Yeah, we would have our representatives. But what is the devil saying when he tempts Jesus? He's saying to Jesus, hey, I, I took it. It's mine. And if you bow down and worship me, then I'll give you the authority of the whole world as long as I'm above you as ultimate Lord of earth. I'll let you, I'll let you run the whole thing. I'll delegate it all to you right under me if you worship me. This is amazing. So now loop back to the beginning of the story, back to Genesis 3.15, which we've read in every single time that we've been together, and that's not accidental, because this is the mother of all prophecies. This is the point from whence comes the entire great controversy and messianic prophetic worldview. If you want to think like a Hebrew, you need to begin with Genesis. And Genesis 3.15 tells us God speaking to the serpent who took the earth from Adam and Eve and is now the Lord, the ruler, the God of this world and this age. God says, I will put enmity, hostility between you, Satan, and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head. He, singular, will crush your head and you will strike or bruise, one version says, his heel. I'm going to suggest to you something that I haven't said in the three pre previous presentations where we've quoted this text. I'm going to suggest to you that if you look at the passage carefully, that Genesis 3 constitutes a declaration of war. God is saying to Satan, who has taken the world, he's saying, this isn't over yet. You took it by deception. I'm going to take it back by truth misrepresented my character and drawn them away from me on the premise of a lie. But I'm going to draw them back to myself on the premise of the truth of who I really am. The lie that Satan told our first parents, it was a three-pronged lie, but the essence of that lie collectively was simply that God is only looking out for his, best in, his own best interest. God doesn't love you, so you better live for yourself. That's Genesis 3, 1 through 5. Jesus comes into the world in order to demonstrate unequivocally and beyond all question that God is love. And it is that revelation that constitutes the fatal blow to Satan's kingdom. So Genesis is a declaration of war. 
So now that we have this Hebrew background, we come to the New Testament and we encounter Jesus and we're not surprised when he tells us this little parable, this little story. He says in Luke chapter 11, verses 21 and 22, he says to the disciples and those who are around him listening, he says, when a strong man, a what? A strong man fully armed guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. So the first part of this little parable, there's a strong man. His strength is acknowledged. And this strong man has a palace, he has a territory, he has a domain, and he has goods. He has possessions. And then Jesus says this, but when a stronger than he, there's a strong man, and now Jesus says, but when a stronger than he comes upon him, the strong man, when a stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor in which he trusted and divides the spoils. What is Jesus saying here? Jesus, in this context, had just sent out the 12 and the 70, and they've come back rejoicing. Hey, even demons flee at your name. And Jesus is simply explaining to them why the demons are fleeing. As the, 70, as the 12 and the 70 go out proclaiming the gospel, the devil is trembling and demons are running for cover. And Jesus, in this little parable, is explaining why. He's saying, okay, I'll tell you what's going on here. The devil is the strong man and he took the world, but I'm here now to take it back. He's telling the disciples that Satan has taken the world and he's guarding his palace and his goods. And Jesus says, but a stronger than he is here now, and that's me, and you're my emissaries, and you're going out not with force and deception, but with the proclamation of the good news of God's love, and the kingdom of Satan is falling proportional to the revelation of God's love. The devil knows that his gig is up, and I'm here now to take away from him all the armor in which he trusted. That is, his lies, his deceptions regarding the character of God. And his kingdom is going to fall now, and he knows it. And then Jesus says, and when I take it back, when I regain the world, when I take it back, I'm going to divide the spoils among my followers. The earth is coming back into human lordship. We will again become the stewards of our planet, and the devil will be expelled from the world. So then, having told us what's going on out of his Hebrew narrative, Jesus explaining that he's here to fulfill Genesis 3.15. He then, as he comes to the close of his ministry, he tells us something is going to happen at Calvary that, again, in a Greek paradigm, we don't notice. We read it. We don't know what to do with it. It doesn't make any sense to us. We opt for the more Greek way of thinking that Jesus died, so I don't have to, so I can go to heaven when I die. Well, Jesus doesn't know anything about this way of thinking. Jesus knows that you're going to go to heaven for a short period of time in the millennium, but that the earth is your home. New heavens, new earth. We're coming back here. In fact, we could hypothetically have a reunion about a million years from now. If you want, we could schedule it. We could have a reunion right here on this very spot. This very earth itself under our feet is under the process of being redeemed by the Messiah. And he's going to give it back to us. Now, yes, Jesus died for our sins and... But what about this dimension of the death of Jesus at the cross? Jesus explains what's going to happen when he dies. Now, he says, is the judgment of this world. Now, the ruler of this world will be cast out. Satan at the cross of Calvary will be cast out. Cast out of what? Where? How? Well, in the large sense, he's going to be cast out of having any more credibility or authority with the human race. In a more detailed sense, he's going to be cast out of the affections 
and the perceptions of human beings so that the true knowledge of the one and only true God takes up residence in our thinking and we fall back in love with God on the premise of his love for us. How do we know that's what Jesus means? Well, because he says so in the next verse. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, he's referring to Calvary, right? When I'm lifted up on the cross, when the devil marshals his forces against me, when the devil and all of his demons come against Jesus at the cross, there is a poetic justice that occurs, and the devil doesn't see it coming. The devil thinks that through deception and force he can win the war. He doesn't understand that there's a deeper power at work in the universe that's foreign to him now. He once knew it. He once knew that God is love. And he once knew what it felt like to be loyal to God out of love. But he deceived himself into believing that God is self-serving in order to justify his own selfish interests. This is what Freud would later call projection. Viewing somebody as guilty of what you're guilty of so that you let yourself off the hook. The devil is deeply entrenched in selfishness to the point where love is now foreign to him. He doesn't even know what it feels like to love and he doesn't know what love looks like and he doesn't see it coming. He can't even remember what it felt like to worship God with adoration. All of that's gone from him now. And Jesus comes and he says that when I die on the cross, something's going to occur that is going to produce two effects. It will bring the kingdom of Satan down. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, well, here's the key word, draw. I'll draw, attract, allure all to me. There will be such a revelation of my love that it will topple the lies that Satan has spun regarding my character. The great controversy is one on the premise of the revelation of who God really is in Christ and most specifically at the cross. So that Paul says it like this. Colossians 2.15, Paul says that something happened at Calvary having disarmed the powers and authorities. He's referring specifically here to Satan and all his demonic hosts who preside over various territories on the earth. But he's referring also to human regimes, human kingdoms, human political engines, human political machines that operate by principles of, of deception, that operate by principles of force. Every kingdom of the world that operates by deception and force is coming down. It's not wise for followers of Jesus to be deeply tied to any political system. I won't say much more about that, but I think you know what I mean. We are captive to the kingdom of Christ and we're just passing through this world to heaven so we can loop back and rule it by covenantal love. So every kingdom of this world and the entire psycho-edifice of Satan's kingdom is coming down because Jesus, having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them at Calvary, triumphing over them by the cross. Now, this is so counterintuitive that we hardly know what it means. You have to pause. You have to take a deep breath. You really have to process this because this scripture, as well as the rest of the New Testament, is essentially saying that God has won the great controversy in precisely the way that nobody expected him to. Even the disciples themselves, right up until the resurrection and ascension and the the, the testimony of Jesus after his resurrection itself and the walk on the road to Emmaus. The disciples themselves the whole time 
were expecting a military Messiah that would take the Roman Empire down by force of arms, that the Messiah, by force of arms, would be seated upon an earthly throne, that James and John would be his right-hand thugs, according to their mother's request, and that God would, listen, basically operate by the same principles as the kingdom of Satan, just with greater power. This is what, this is, what is called in history the myth of redemptive violence. This is the idea that is articulated in Scripture when the Bible says, uh, be warned, the Bible says, two times in the teachings of Jesus, and then it's repeated in, in Revelation 13. He who kills with the sword will be killed with the sword. Don't operate by principles of force and coercion. Don't force the conscience. Leave people free. Why? Because freedom is the only way that it is possible for a human being to love God. The moment force is entered into the equation, whether it's emotional force or physical force, the mo or theological force in doctrines like eternal torment, it's a form of force. All of these, these doctrines constitute theological and emotional coercion. And that's the principle that Satan is operating on. But what's happening in Christ is that he is toppling the kingdom of darkness not by force of arms, but by subjecting himself to the violence of humanity and responding to their hatred and violence with love and forgiveness. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You can just picture Satan <laughs> at this point chomping at the bit. No, no, not forgive them. Retaliate. Save yourself, the Roman soldiers said. Save yourself, the two thieves beside him said. Save yourself, the mob cried. If you are the Son of God, save yourself. That was the temptation. If Jesus would have crossed the line to exert force or coercion in any form to save himself, the kingdom would have been forfeited to Satan's control. The devil is mad, as in insane, with an insatiable desire to, through violence, push Jesus over the line to stop loving you and me because of what we're doing to him. But when Jesus dies with the covenantal faithfulness of God intact in his heart, the kingdom of Satan is defeated in his expiring breath. Jesus comes forth from the grave, not by some kind, of, some kind of arbitrary act of God. Jesus comes forth from the grave by virtue of the victory that he gained by loving us to the end. Our Savior, our brother, our Lord, is one who has conquered the kingdom of darkness by truth and love rather than deception and force. The gospel commission, therefore, is a call of God upon us as human beings to spread the good news of who God is and what he's really like as displayed in Christ. The point of the biblical story is not that God as God would regain control of the world. That wouldn't have taken 6,000 years. If it were merely a matter of sheer power, God has the sheer power. If it were merely a matter of force, God has the force. He could snap his fingers and by sheer force destroy all his enemies. 
But the point of the biblical story is not that God as God would regain control of the world, but that God as man, the second Adam, the son of God, would regain control of the world by truth and love. The whole thing came back into human control, and according to the Gospel of John, as many as receive this Messiah in the display of his love, as many as receive him, he gave the right, the authority, the authority to become sons of God, even to those who believe on his name, his character, the display of God's love that is manifested in him. So that finally, when we come to the end of John chapter 1, the narrative very clearly tells us that the one who is the Son of God, John 1, 49, is the Son of God in the Davidic sense of the Hebrew narrative. He's the Son of God in the sense that he is the King of Israel. He is now here the rightful ruler of the world, and now John 3, 16 finally makes sense. In this very trajectory, in this very narrative form. For God so loved the world with the covenantal love that the Hebrew prophets articulated and foretold. God so loved the world, Jews and Gentiles alike, that he gave, out of covenantal faithfulness, his only begotten covenantal son, that whoever believes that he is, in fact, the new Adam, the new head of the human race, should not perish under the covenant curses articulated by Moses, but have everlasting life under the covenant blessings articulated by Moses. John 3.16 is not trying to communicate anything to us like we have generally thought. John 3.16 is telling us that the Son of God and the Savior of the world is the one in whom planet Earth has been regained for human regency and stewardship. We are sons and daughters of God by virtue of the victory that Jesus gained on our behalf. Thank you for your time.